Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the second chapter of Luke's gospel, verses 21 to 41. Listen to God's word. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of dirt turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested upon him. Now it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So guided by the Spirit, Simeon came to the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed about what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now there was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow until the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to, to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, when they had finished everything required by the law of Israel, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, your word has indeed taken on flesh and dwelt among us. Draw near to us now and open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds so that we might draw near to you, not only in this moment, but each moment of our lives, so that your good news might be proclaimed through our lips and our actions. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, before I start with my sermon, I'm going to make a confession to you. I strayed from the lectionary for today. The passage I was supposed to read was the passage from Matthew's Gospel. I will mention it in my reading today, in my sermon today, but it just seemed a little too difficult a text for the very first day of a very new year. So we'll circle back to that another time. But for now, we're going to pretend we are in the B cycle of the lectionary season just for today, just for this first Sunday. And I can 
perhaps redeem myself because this is always the gospel reading on the first day of the year, all right? But it's not of the first Sunday of Christmas in year A. All right, I can preach now with a clear conscience, right? Okay, so there are many stories that have been told over and over again in my family. Now these stories border somewhere between truth or fact and myth. There is Uncle Frank, I think I've mentioned him to you before. He is a vaudevillian performer and allegedly one day, St. Patrick's Day in fact, performed before Al Capone. Now there is also a cat named Trouble who allegedly painted the walls of my grandparents' home with his tail after sliding along a freshly painted railing outside. And then there is this assertion that Kennywood, you know, Pittsburgh's best amusement park, is on farmland that belonged to my family because my great-grandmother was a Kenny, and every time we went to Kennywood as children, my pap would tell us, you're coming home to your family's farm. <laughs> All right, so there is enough in these stories that is connected to proven fact. There really was an Uncle Frank, and he really was a vaudevillian performer. There also really was a cat named Trouble that was rescued from the rail yard where my great-grandpa worked. And my great-grandmother, my pap-ap's mom, was from the line of the Kennys. But there is just enough fantastical lore woven into each yarn that my grandfather would tell over a dining table that every time Pap would oh, tell us a story with this twinkle in his eye and the assurance of truth, we couldn't help but wonder how much of his story was filled with imagination and how much might be able to be fact-checked for a biography of his life. Now, the Bible only tells us a few stories about Jesus that take place in those years after his birth, or even days after his birth, and before he walked along the Sea of Galilee calling fishermen to be disciples. Matthew and Luke each give us a glimpse into Jesus' early life with stories that seem unto themselves to straddle myth and reality. Now, Matthew's story, the one I was going to skip for today, is filled with angels who give instructions in dreams. They are filled with stories of those working behind the scenes to keep Jesus, the small baby, safe from a tyrant's wrath. Matthew tells the story of a king's terror and a family's escape to a foreign city and of and every time, every stroke of the story is told with Matthew drawing a straight line between a story of Jesus' birth and a word from a prophet of old. Past prophecies come true in your hearing in Matthew's gospel. Jesus, he asserts, is the one for whom all of Israel has been waiting. Matthew's storytelling confirms it. Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the one sent from God to set all people free. So now, although Luke is different in his technique, he is a master storyteller in his own right. He also connects the laws of, of scripture and songs and old texts and story arcs to the story of Jesus' birth. He takes his own angle, tapping into the collective imagination of a people of faith, reminding us of God's faithfulness again in surprising ways. 
Luke reminds us again of Hannah dedicating her own son Samuel to God in a temple. He reminds us of God's covenant to Abraham through circumcision, of temple rituals outlined in the law. Luke demonstrates once more the diligent obedience, the yes of Mary and of Joseph, and how even in their exceptional circumstances, they offer not a case for their own exceptionalism, but model for us humble faithfulness from which we all could learn a lesson or two. Certainly, I could. And as Luke does all throughout his gospel, the birth narratives in the first two chapters of his story set the stage for what is to come in the chapters that follow. For Luke pens a story not only of spiritual renewal, but societal transformation. Salvation comes to the world. Salvation comes to the poor, through the poor. In God, in Jesus, God will dismantle spiritual hierarchies and the hierarchies of the world where welcome, where outcasts will be welcomed, playing fields will be leveled, economies will be transformed, and all people will be set free. And so in our text for today, we need, read not just one, but two more proclamations of God's saving work that has shown up in Jesus. We are told in these two chapters of Luke's gospel, once more, that Luke matches up another pair of storytellers in Simeon and Anna, as he had done just a chapter earlier with the songs of Zechariah and Mary. Now these two strangers to whom we are introduced today are largely unremarkable. They are old, they are alone, but they are persistent in their hope. And they lay eyes on a baby who has been brought to the temple and recognize in, with such distinct clarity that the child being consecrated in their midst is the Messiah. Their Savior is here in their very arms, right before their very eyes. Now Luke does the same thing again and again in the first two chapters of his gospel. God's good news is told again and again through unexpected voices of young girls and old women, of shepherds and once silenced priests. Angels come straight from God with a message of promised peace to those who others have ignored or forgotten. Voices, silenced, sing out, and then they sing out some more, for God has come to change things up, to heal what was broken, and to make things right. Now, one commentator says this, the story of Jesus' birth and early life in Luke makes room for a variety of bodies and proximities to the gospel message. It makes room for women and men. It makes room for youth and elder. It makes room for the poor, disappointed, and unsuspecting. The good news of Jesus' birth is that insiders and outsiders of our immediate communities and families can carry the good news of God's salvation liberation, acceptance, not just to others in the world, but to us as well. Luke insists that the good news is best heard through the broadest, widest breadth of voices. Not simply so that more people can hear the gospel, though that is good, but so that more people can hear and notice that God is with them and for them too. God calls and claims those that others have cast aside and says, you belong, you are loved, you have a purpose, you are a part of the story, you are mine. So we begin this new year of worship together, showing up in faith and hope ourselves. 
My guess is that we all long to encounter God with us, and that we want to attune our hearts and our eyes and our senses and our minds to what God is up to in our world today. Now perhaps we hope that if we start off the new year on the right foot, each step into 2023 will be a bit more blessed, maybe easier than 2022. For some of us, a new year is an opportunity to make a fresh start, to exercise more and swear less, to let go of something or someone that caused us suffering or confusion or too much worry, to work with greater intention and to make sure that we get more rest. However we wish to mark this day or head into the days ahead, Luke extends an invitation to us. Friends, he says, pay attention. Pay attention to dreams and songs and life lessons that seem to parallel your experiences in odd ways. Pay attention to scripture and stories of our faith. We are a people of the word. By encountering those stories, by listening and seeing nuances and sensing the surprises, we might understand more what God is saying to us in our day too. Pay attention to others, to tired young couples who show up with an infant in their arms, to strangers and outcasts and those who are fleeing danger. Pay attention to the needs of children and help secure their place in the world so that they might not just survive, but thrive. And to pay attention to a God who is, even now, at work in our midst. Notice the chapter of God's story of which you are a part. For we are all characters in the larger drama of faith and hope and love. See, if there is one thing that Luke wants to make sure we know loud and clear, it is that we are God's storytellers too. God shows up to us and through us. God has given us voices. God has given us bodies to enact and proclaim the good news of God. We are members of the surprising cast of characters in this chapter of God's story as God works in this world today. We are the ones to whom God offers guidance and promise and hope and challenge and peace. We are the ones who extend and receive mercy and compassion. We are the story and the storyteller, even when the details of our lives feel like they straddle the line between biography and mythology. Ours are the voices that now proclaim God's gracious presence, redemptive work, and love. And so this year I extend the invitation to you as well. Pay attention, not just to what God is doing out there, but to what God is doing in here. Pay attention to how God's story is bubbling up within your experiences and your insights and your aspirations and your troubles. Pay attention to the words that are emerging on your hearts and your minds and dare to give voice to God's work through you. Friends, what is it that you have to say? 
What is the good news that you have to share? Now, as I look back to 2022 in my own life, my story was one of God's steadiness in a world of change. Many of you know that 2022 for me and my family included unexpected illness, as well as the death of my father. We all have been navigating an extended season of change here at this church. And my own child started kindergarten, which is unmooring enough as it is. The only way that I stayed upright was to let go. Me, who likes to control whatever I can, who likes to plan for every contingency, who likes to insist that I'm strong enough and have enough energy and enough poise and enough hope for it all, had to just let go of the way things were. I had to let go of what I hoped would be, and I could just do my best in any present moment and trust that I would find God there. The good news is I did. In unexpected and surprising ways, I found comfort and hope. I found laughter and purpose. I found peace even in great struggle. And I found strength and even joy. There were things for which I could be truly grateful, not just because we're taught to always look on the bright side of things, but because there were blessings. Now, I don't know what 2023 will hold, and I'm trying to enter a new year holding all things loosely so that I might be present to what God is up to, so that I might have eyes and ears and a heart and a mind that are open to with a fresh perspective rather than a solid attachment to what has always been. I wonder what 2023 will hold, but what I trust is that God is here now and God is with us all through this journey. So let's pay attention together because we will see a lot more that way. And I am happy to continue to tell stories of faith and hope and love, but I invite your voices into the storytelling arena too because through the voices and stories and insights and hopes of one another, we will most clearly see God at work in our midst. It's that priesthood of all believers thing that we say we believe in as Presbyterians. The Spirit of God is with us all, leading us into this new chapter, strengthening us for the journey, anointing our voices with stories that need to be told so that we might notice God at work in our midst too. All right, storytellers, let's head into this new year together, knowing that the God who was cradled in a manger, foretold by angels, visited by shepherds, and embraced in the temple by octogenarian prophets is with us right here and right now, too. So pay attention. And in all things, thanks be to God. Amen.